not the most ideal way to actually <clears throat> um, to really showcase your work, but you can almost think of it as once a lifetime challenge and and how you really need to turn it into an opportunity. Um, so the US is by far the richest and most powerful nation. And yet this pandemic is showing how fragile everything we have built so far, including many really taking it for granted concept and narrative. So, you know, you guys are in the, in the Silicon Valley. Look at these most valuable and powerful technology companies. There's nothing they could do. I mean, the only thing they could do is just tracking people, which is the basic cell phone technology. So they're really not adding much. And so I really like you guys to actually take advantage of this unfortunate pandemic and reflect on where do you want to go? Because this is only your beginning. You will be shaping the future that you deserve. So do we continue on this path of massive consumption and continue to just look at growth at all costs and look at the inequality, look at our healthcare system Look at the vulnerable populations, the older adult, the marginalized communities. They are the ones who are suffering the most. And even among our students, some of our students are struggling. So I really want to challenge you guys that it is really about the greater good. It is about really shifting the technology development with this fellowship, because I want you guys to go beyond these companies down in the valley. Look at what they do. All they do is trying to hijack your consciousness and then modify your behaviors. That's it. Really, in a nutshell, it's kind of sad that people can only communicate with each other to these third party companies that only interest they have is to modify your behavior. So that's why you don't see me on Facebook and LinkedIn on anything. And so I'm actually pretty happy about my decision, <laughs> staying away from all these really, to me, add no value to society. Anyway, so that's my soapbox. So here's a radical idea I'd like you guys to think about as you wrap up your work uh, as honest funk fellows, but also really, stepping outside, getting outside of the bubble of Berkeley and change the world. So here's a radical idea I'd like you guys to think about. If you take a view, take a very, very long view of Mother Earth from the space, this a little blue marble. Let's say you are not actually a human being. You were born an ego. And you're flying around, enjoying the environment, whatever's left of it that you still have left for your habitat. That's the gift. The gift of life, the gift of resources to sustain life. But yet, we human actually come up with our own strange narrative and story that we, be, we believe in. And we change, we create all these concepts, abstract concepts, and how we divvy up the world in, so, in such unequal fashions. So I like you guys to think of it. If you look at, if you were to think of Mother Earth as the greatest, the ultimate platform of gift, it's the ultimate gift ecology, let's say. How would you rewrite the narrative for all beings? And we're not gonna live in harmony, but at least live in balance. So let's go. Awesome, thank you so much, Coleman. Uh, just so everyone's aware, uh, we are going to dive into student presentations and the students will have 
roughly five minutes to present each team. There are going to be four teams. Uh, and then we'll have five to 10 minutes of Q&A and open discussion. And we hope that you all will be uh, active in that discussion um, and can unmute yourselves uh, for that section of the, of the evening. So uh, we are going to open it up with the draft team. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll allow you guys to start sharing. I'm not sure if Rosie's computer just crashed here. Um, so we might not be able to share it. Okay, well, we can um, give you guys another little bit of time and maybe if the ADAPT team is ready to go, we can jump to the ADAPT team and draft will come back to you. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Give me a thumbs up, ADAPT, if you're all good. Okay, cool. I'll be sharing. All right, can everyone see? Yep. Is everyone on my team unmuted just to be ready? Ready to go. All right. Yep. Um, good evening, everyone. We're really excited to tell you about our project, Clothing, a Form of Care, First Adaptive Apparel, and now Personal Protective Equipment. This is Arthur. He's 90 years old, and he moved into an Elder Care Alliance facility many years ago with his wife, Esther. Unfortunately, recently, Esther had a fall, which um, made her paralyzed from the neck down and requires her to be dressed every morning by someone else. This is either Arthur or a doting caregiver named Wendy. This is the care triangle that my team has been focused on all year. And through our initial user research, we found that when it comes to clothing, Arthur is um, generally worried about Esther. Esther is generally uncomfortable when someone else is dressing her. And Wendy is trying her best, but very busy. So our team created a prototype that would address these pain points. We wanted to make Arthur less worried and Wendy less busy and Esther more comfortable. Our idea was a DIY or do-it-yourself adaptive clothing kit that would allow for Arthur or Wendy to mend Esther's clothing to make more comfortable when she was getting dressed. And as design testing goes, we found this was not desirable. Arthur and Wendy were not interested in mending Esther's clothing and it wasn't feasible, wasn't feasible because um, the ECA facilities didn't have the right equipment. So this was early March and we were about to go back to the drawing board and think about how can we solve the pain point of comfort. But as you all know, in early March, we were all thrust into a pandemic and it became really clear that the pain point was not just about comfort, but really about safety. And all of a sudden our DIY or do it yourself ideas became more relevant again. So here we have the care triangle once again, even with this new pain point, we haven't forgotten who we are designing our new PPE project for. Despite the pandemic, there is good news. Community members like Jill are eager to help. She is part of our care square, addressing Arthur's worries, Esther's discomfort, and Wendy's fears. So how might we provide care for older adults during a pandemic? We will provide PPE for Wendy. For example, at the start of our project, our research addressed different PPE needs, but as the needs of ECA changed, our project did too. We are now focusing on gowns, so Romina will be describing our potential solutions. After conducting research on non-surgical gowns, which included materials, patterns, aligning with ECA about price points and the number of gowns needed, we came up with three potential solutions. Number one was the plastic single-use gown. Number two was the design named Peekaboo. And number three was CW reusable gown. Because solution number one was not reusable and ECA had predicted high turnaround, we decided to test our reusable options. Thanks to our wonderful volunteer, Jill, which I think she's on this call. Shout out to you, Jill, for making this happen. 
We tested these two patterns. Jill gave us feedback on both designs and based on the time taken to make them and how easy it was for her to get this done, we decided to go with the CW reusable gown design. This gown hits um, all of our product requirements in terms of desirability because it withstands um, heavy washing, viability because of the low cost of production and feasibility because it is easy for our volunteers to follow even if they're new to sewing. Once we found our gown design, we decided to include it in the emergency PPE plan document which, which we've created. We want to have all, an all-encompassing document for our DIY PPE to serve for future emergency situations. Now, Yo-Yo will tell you a little bit more about this document. To put that all in a bigger picture, our final product is made up of three components. First, the finalized gown plan will detail the step-by-step -step instructions and in scaling of production for one gown unit. And this would ultimately be included in our ECA emergency PPE plan, the bigger document that houses all the designs, making procedure, and strategy for the masks, shoe covers, and face shields for our sewers. And our last and third component is the playbook to show other care facilities the roles, steps, and supply chains needed to make all the sourcing and sewing happen across at-risk communities in the United States. And moving forward, our timeline for this month is to recruit volunteers, retrieve design feedback from ECA, and make necessary changes to our gown plan. And by mid-May, we will order and disseminate materials to volunteers while managing their progress and finalizing our playbook. And on May 30th, we will hit our finish line by delivering at least 500 gowns so that Wendy and her colleagues are well protected while taking care of Esther and other residents at ECA. To wrap everything up, we are Team Adapt and we all care about the needs of older adults. We would also like to extend our special thanks to staff, local communities, mentors who made all of this happen. And a quick call to action, if you are interested in sewing and making gowns with us, now is the time. Feel free to contact us at adaptgowns at gmail.com. And now we would like to open up the floor for any comments, questions, and feedback. Thank you. Well, this is Rosemary Jordan from Elder Care Alliance. I'd like to chime in and just say a huge thank you to Team Adapt. Uh, I wanna make a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, I want to say what an amazing pivot that this team um, under, undertook. I remember very vividly Shirley's face the day that we got on a Zoom when you all first um, were restricted to your rooms. And I said that the most important thing that your team could do for me now was to work on a backup plan for our backup plan for our PPE and huge love and affection and appreciation for the whole team just really rising to this moment, meeting this need. And I've said it before to them privately, but I wanna to say to everybody, this is groundbreaking work. Um, the deliverable that they have prepared in draft is a roadmap for all of California and the country this type of thing really doesn't exist in a comprehensive way and it's going to be a lasting benefit to many many people and i want to say we badly need those gowns <laughs> so i really want to echo their call to action i hope that any of you who know someone who can sew will please pass along the recommendation um, and join in to this effort thank you so much Wonderful. Does anyone else have uh, any questions for the team? No questions, but this is Amanda Brief. Um, I served as an industry mentor and I'm really proud of the team and just wanted to give them a shout out for their amazing pivot and resilience and thought that they put into this. Uh, this is just ball. I have um, first. I want to say congratulations. Um, it feels like it feels like it was like three or four months ago that we talked about that potential pivot with you all, but I think it was more like a month uh, ago or five weeks ago. Um, and I'm uh, like Rosemary said, just so impressed by what y'all have been able to accomplish in in a short amount of time. I guess one question I have is. Um, around socializing this for uh, audiences other than Elder Care Alliance. What, um, what ideas do you have there? And, um, 
what help do you need um, to get to get this out there? So I think if that's a question for me, I would say there are a couple of different ways that um, communication can happen. In every state, there are associations of senior living communities. And here in California, there's one that represents skilled nursing and one that represents assisted living. Um, and assisted living is the one area that's getting the least amount of support and attention right now. And so the California Assisted Living Association would be the place to um, provide some communication and connection, uh, I would say. It's actually a very intimate group of people. One of the things that I think we're learning um, through the media's not really very positive coverage of our industry is that a very small number of people are caring for a massive amount of our older adult population. They're doing it on very thin resources. Um, but the good thing is it's a family of people across the country all helping one another. So let me just say, word will spread very quickly <laughs> um, through our networks, and that's something that we can absolutely um, collaborate on. That's fantastic. Thanks, Rosemary. It looks like we had a, a question come in from the chat. Um, Alex, did you want to read it out loud? or? Um... Yes, I can unmute myself. Um, there's been several DIY sewing projects that have been publicized over the last um, year. For example, cloth masks, um, um, cloth sacks for um, animals that suffered in, uh, from Australian uh, bushfires or uh, cloth face coverings for um, uh, uh, COVID responders. Um, and I'm wondering if you feel that there could be some um, competition in terms of your call to action. Yeah, that's probably true. There could be some additional competition and I'll, I'll let the team weigh in based on their experience too. But I also think we're, we're entering a phase where attention to the adult, older adult population and unmet needs is getting um, a new community of people interested in um, what they can do to help. Um, and people who felt like they've contributed everything they can to acute care hospitals are looking for another way um, and another audience and a care setting that they um, can contribute to. And I also um, would like to say that I think um, Jill, who is on, represents a group of people who are just new to working on gowns. Gowns is not a category of PPE items where there has been a lot of attention so far. So this very particular call to action, I think, will not duplicate other efforts. Thank you for saying that, Rosemary. And one thing I'll just also add, um, when thinking about like the scale of 500 gowns and how many volunteers would be required if we had everyone complete one gown start to finish is really daunting. But one thing that we made um, incredibly, like we were intentional about in designing the pattern was that we could break up the process into steps. So for example, if you haven't been a sewer, but you really are seeing this call to action and are really compelled by that, you can cut for us and you can trace patterns that will then be cut. So we kind of addressed that fatigue of like sewers being needed so um, intensely to break up their work so that they can only focus on sewing and hopefully optimize their output. Thank you, that's really exciting to hear about cutting patterns. Wonderful. Any other questions, comments before we move on? Okay, well, congratulations to the ADAPT team. Uh, we all are, are so proud of the work that you've done. Uh, and now let's hand it off uh, to the draft team. Uh, Rosie, are you able to share your screen? Daniel had said there were some computer difficulties. Uh, I, I'm, I'm back. I'm wondering if one of my other teammates can handle the screen share. My computer is very cranky right now. I know mine will crash too if I do it, so. Uh, why don't I give it a shot? Let's see. Great. 
Teamwork makes a dream work. <laughs> I love the celebration. My housemates just tuned in. Sorry. Is it working by any chance? We yeah, see, yeah we can see your screen. Okay. Let me go. All right. All right. Um, so we are Team Draft, um, and we are really excited to present to you the Loop Initiative. Um, so this project actually started not just last semester, but last year as trans... Oops, can we get the next... Um, oh, oh, technical question. All right, so our project actually started last year. Um, as transfer students, we were welcomed into the Fung Fellowship classroom, which was a stark contrast to the othering and isolation we felt in overwhelmingly large major classes across campus. So as we all are pretty aware, mental health is a huge concern for college students, and an unwelcoming atmosphere like this only serves to exacerbate those issues. So we wanted to explore the difference between these two classrooms and how we might intervene with an impactful innovation. Um, so we started by looking at numbers. Um, and we found out that uh, in 61A, which is the picture you saw, uh, computer science 61A, uh, the student to professor ratio is actually 2000 to one, which seemed crazy to us. Um, and so, through uh, contextual inquiry and landscape analysis, we identified EECS, uh, electrical engineering and computer science as a department where we could have a profound large scale change. So EECS enrollment has been growing dramatically over the past several years, but at a much faster rate for male identified folks as compared to others. So there's also a growing gender gap. Minority students, um, feel othered and they experience isolation and stress even more profoundly than their peers. And then flaring out the campus at large, the majority of students reported a lack of communication with their instructors. Yeah, so our group decided to add this snapshot of a B course post that perfectly demonstrates what Rosie just shared with us, um, how the lack of communication leads to academic distress um, during the current pandemic, a professor deflated um, grade bins to align with um, historical curves. So this is a great example of how there's a lack of communication between professors and students. This professor just like decided to deflate the grades without any notice. And in our discovery and defining phase, um, we conducted ethnographic interviews that allowed for our team to better understand the challenge that we're trying to solve. In addition to um, speaking with professors and students, um, we conducted semi-structured interviews with um, industry experts in the educational and tech policy fields. Um, some of the common themes identified through our customer engagement was the lack of communication between professors and students in the traditional channels like office hours. And ironically, this lack of communication is also shared by teacher assistants who are students themselves. Um, They've also expressed that uh, their fellow students um, fear speaking in the class and rarely share feedback regarding the course. Um, we didn't observe this issue in other departments. Um, interdisciplinary students that have experienced other departments outside of the elect the EECS department shared that they felt more comfortable um, walking into their professor's office hours. Uh, so we began to notice a trend here um, that there's a big, um, disconnect between students and teachers. And this um, disconnect takes many forms and have um, many negative side effects. Um, a lot of students feel that they're lost in the crowd and that they're, they're voiceless. And the social and academic um, stress is only exacerbated by 
this lack of communication between staff and students. And it is not really um, a problem of um, resources. It's actually, um, it is that existing resources are underutilized because students lack awareness and confidence to take advantage of these resources. So drawing from insights made last semester, we were interested in how we might build a connected community that fosters open communication while cultivating diversity and inclusion of people from various academic backgrounds. Uh, but drawing from more current insights, we decided that we can impact diversity and inclusion across the department by bridging communication gaps between faculty and students, increasing mental health across the board. So this focus toward honing in on the improvement communication channels between students, professors, and administration is based on a subtly weak understanding from faculty about students' concerns and their student experience. So we would now like to bridge that gap and build that connected community by optimizing the utilization of and access to existing resources. And so the first prototype that we will discuss is the chatbot, which serves as an all-purpose assistant, primarily for the students' classes, as well as academic life throughout time on campus. Uh, the main focus is in offering paths towards the resources we mentioned, whether it be reminding where and what ops hours of professors is being held currently, or ahead of time, and as well as potential time and locations offering one-on-one -on -one or group tutoring in their major, which Berkeley is known to offer. Uh, we believe what makes it different from searching on other apps is the fact that the student does not need to rely on knowing keywords of the answer to his or her question prior to searching in order for it to match on a search engine, whether it's on a Berkeley website or Piazza. So essentially, we think that conversational input makes the search process for an answer regarding resources a lot easier. Um, so along with a chatbot, um, we need to somehow communicate the struggles that students have uh, to professors and we wanted to collect feedback at a different time than what is usually collected at unlike regular office hours that happen once every week um big x classes have 40 uh, hours of office hours every week um and this time where students are really waiting for to get help uh, is the best time to ask to see what they're struggling with and get some feedback from them um so we kind of thought about this virtual office queue um, that kind of collects feedback and also takes this feedback and in the back end synthesizes the issues that are kind of appearing again and again through a natural language processing algorithm. Um, and then this natural language processing algorithm ranks what are the most uh, important issues that are currently uh, students experiencing and in real time conveys that to um, a group of students and professors that can come together and kind of brainstorm solutions that are a lot more informed than the post that you've seen earlier for uh, MAP53. Um, so we call this part of the natural language processing and the ideation generation community because it gives us insights into what students are really thinking about and kind of generates solutions that beforehand wouldn't be generated because professors were just not aware of what students are feeling. Yeah, you can skip this one. So then for our next steps through this month, we're going to continue and pull together some more user engagement and recruitment. We're going to conduct desirability testing a little bit more thoroughly on our prototypes. Through the summer, we are going to build out the components of our office hours data collection and improvement tools, as well as engage with professors of targeted classes to develop specific plans to roll out in the fall. Then in the fall, we will test the entire framework prototype um, in one to two large scale each classes. Thank you so much. That concludes our presentation. Okay, thank you, um, team draft. So we lost um, Caroline, uh, but so she'll be logging back in, but go ahead and um, if there are questions for this team. I had a quick question. Um, 
So I know having previously worked as a GSI uh, in the EECS department, sometimes a lot of the decisions, like the GSIs hear a lot of the pain points of the students, but when we bring it up to a professor, it's just like quickly shot down. So I'm curious if you've heard um, or if you've talked to any professors and who like just don't really care that much and to see like how you could meet like mediate a conversation with them because I would really love that. I don't think that it's a one solution fits all but I think that the fact that now professors will have access to students and all GSIs might actually make the difference. Um, from our research we discovered that students are just they fear of walking into professors office hours sometimes um, and Obviously, just like students are more comfortable with their peers, professors are a lot more comfortable with people that they work with um, regularly, which includes GSIs. So I think that if they hear this feedback from a person which they should hear feedback from, but they're not, um, it might actually help us be more, they'll be more sensitive for this feedback and perhaps consider it more. Awesome, thanks. Who are you working with uh, at the EECS department? Um, so there are a couple of people that we are currently working with. Uh, it's, we started working at the beginning, uh, we got support from Kara Nelson, that's the Dean of uh, Diversity and Equity. Um, and we were trying to partner uh, with Dan Garcia, who's one of the CS professors, um, or Josh Hag. Um, and we also got the support um, of, I think Christopher Hahn helped us a lot with like kind of the teaching side of things. Um, and that's pretty much it. Other questions for this team? I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, this is Javier, I'm alumni from the Fung Fellowship. Um, a question regarding the data that will be fed into the NLP. Um, those concerns and the issues that students will address, will, they, will, those, will that demographic data be disaggregated and then um, shown to professors or GSIs or the academic community uh, to see what, you know, where those concerns are coming from, whether it's from four-year students, transfer students, underrepresented students, students from low-income communities or like that identify, and then students from, you know, those other, the student organizations that you intend on um, interviewing with? So the idea is to, like you're saying, cluster what feedback comes from what minority group, assuming that students will identify. Um, it's a little bit tricky because you gotta make the uh, data anonymized and also the amount of feedback that you can collect during uh, those same timestamps that we were talking about, like in office hours, uh, it's not a lot. We really wanna make sure that the quality of the data that we're getting there um, is, is what we're, we're emphasizing. If you ask someone to fill out a long survey, it's a little bit more difficult and the quality of the data goes down. Um, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to have uh, brainstorming sessions that include students from specific minority groups because they might see stuff differently than just the average student. Um, and this will allow professors to really understand whether one minority group might suffer from something more than another minority group. Yeah, I think that would be really interesting because I think the professor will be more prone to respond with you coming in with a data set or some kind of context backing up the data of those concerns and where it's coming from. So I think that would be really cool to have some context and data behind those concerns from the student community. Definitely. Maybe just one more comment. Um, instead of just using NLP, to capture information from the students. Maybe you should also offer the opportunity to the GSI as well as the faculty members and ask them to actually develop class specific um, surveys so that whether the students actually understand certain concept or particular delivery and uh, as a way to gauge their their understanding or not, um, as another option, another opportunity to really promote a conversation, and and 
in the survey data, it's a little bit more structure. So it's a good to have some structured data as well as some non-structured data. And so you basically, you want to provide additional hooks to the faculty member so that they feel like, oh, I can actually get assessment. And so I think that may make the, um, your whole app uh, much more effective. Excellent. Thank you so much Thank for that you. feedback. Yeah, really nice work, um, team draft. I think also it's so timely as we're moving into potentially remote and even more isolated learning. So I think it's um, really that you have that hybrid model. So big um, congratulations to you and your team. Well done. Thank you. So now we Wonderful. will have... Um, Sorry, Caroline, are you back on? We're both, we're co-hosting now. Yes, I am back on, but okay. um, before there was some audio problems. So if you want to keep, keep managing the back end, that's totally fine. Either way. So I think we have uh, Spreading Smiles um, next and Miko is going to share the slides and yeah, great. Great, can everyone hear me fine? Yes. Perfect, all right. So I attended my first funeral when I was 12. Max passed away January 5th, 2011, a few weeks shy of his 19th birthday. I grew up with him as a brother and he was the kind of energetic, enthusiastic person who just lights up a room. His parents actually attribute his infectious positivity as the reason he outlived every childhood doctor's estimated lifespan. Max lived life, well, to the max. Wherever he went, he spread smiles and nothing, not even months in a hospital, away from friends and in pain could take that away. A decade later, I now volunteer at Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland, and I so often wish I had Max's ability to bring cheer and brightness to everyone around me. Teens in particular take hospitalization hard, and their self-esteem and mental health take a hit as so much of their time is spent as a patient rather than as an athlete, a student, or a friend. It's hard to find a way to pass the time and connect with friends in long-term hospital stays, particularly for those in isolation units. As an homage to my late friend, I asked a few fellows to help me find a way to normalize patients' lives and start spreading smiles. So our team prototyped a daily drawing challenge app where patients can submit their art and have the opportunity to be featured on the hospital-wide broadcast called The Cho Show. So you can sign up with your language preference and every day there would be a challenge which is different for every patient. And with enough streak days, you can earn um, certain prizes. So with each challenge, there's a prompt and you can be as creative as you want with the prompt and draw. If you don't have a tablet or uh, like an iPad, you can print this prompt out and then upload it once you've drawn. And once you share, you can see the top drawings of the day on the leaderboard where the ones that have had the most reactions are featured and could be featured in the Cho Show as well. And you could see how many reactions you got. The news feed is kind of the random um, drawings that have been submitted that you can also react to in the news feed. And finally, if you get a little bit bored and you wanna you know, do some more drawings, you can go to your past challenges and, um, and be even more creative the next time you draw. So in our conversations with medical professionals, they really informed us that teenage patients in particular can suffer from a lack of agency. So they encouraged us to pursue an idea that would allow them to create. So we like this uh, product because it allows us to address boredom by having them do an independent activity. They can keep their creation on their device or keep it physically and it'll give them a sense of personal fulfillment. There's also a sense of social fulfillment that we're hoping to provide by addressing loneliness between patients. So there's a sense of connection between patients because they can respond to the same prompt, they can react to each other, they can see how other people might address the same prompt differently. 
And finally, one of the challenges that we faced was dealing with HIPAA. The hospital really encouraged us to uh, have a text light approach as they would prefer to not have patients risk sharing any identifying information about themselves. At first, this seemed like a challenge, but later we saw that it was an opportunity to have a really culturally humble approach. Um, as you've seen in our app, our product is mainly text-less. There, isn't, there aren't so many words and the focus is on the prompt itself. And so that allows us to address a lot of patients who might have different language backgrounds. You're on mute. Hello. Hi. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm having, I was having internet difficulty. Um, so next up, we worked on solving challenges through iteration. Um, and the first thing that we really wanted to focus on was competition through um, and competition and ensuring that there was enough competition versus self-motivation. And so our users really explained to us that they enjoyed the side of competition that allowed them to compete with other people and see other people's drawings, but they really had a hard time when they didn't get as many likes as they wanted. And so what we decided to do was have people compete with themselves. And so we streak system where people were um, trying to see how many drawings that they themselves could do. And then we also wanted to have a larger community type of competition. So we did introduce leaderboards in which they can see the top drawings of the day, but we wanted to ensure that they could only see the number of likes that they personally had. So they can see the top drawings, but not how many people liked them or reacted to them. Next up, we really wanted to see if we wanted to do small groups versus hospital wide groups. Um, and so with our engagement, we really ended up leaning towards hospital wide groups because we realized that this helped foster a larger community and it helped patients see that they had a bigger supporting system that really understood what they were going through um, and we thought small groups might be great for future gamification but that's something that we really wanted to iterate more in the future and focus on hospital wide currently and the last thing that we really wanted to look at was technology and this is something that the professionals really told us to focus in on where technology is okay for a child especially when they're hospitalized but when someone has just had chemotherapy or has just left surgery or it's 10 o'clock at night technology Technology isn't the best source. And so we wanted to make sure that children and patients could download each drawing that they wanted and then later upload them as needed. So next up, we just wanted to extend a blanket of thank yous to everyone. That was a really, really big part of our project and that helped guide us throughout the entire process. Um, and lastly, we'd love to answer any questions that you have for us. Um, and these are our separate little stuff drawings that, <laughs> that was um, from the prompt, draw a duck and share your art. Yeah, hi, this is Hassan. I'm, I'm joining as a industry partner slash coach and I just wanted to give a shout out to this team. Um, the courage with which they approached uh, this topic. I've been in the diversity and inclusion field for the last 13 years. And just to see the passion of youngsters to create this sense of inclusion and in community is was really refreshing. Um, and I, I just want to mention there were a couple of challenges that this team faced, whether it was HIPAA requirements, hospital not giving information, surge in a hospital because of something, but the resilience and the comeback this team shared during our catch-up calls was simply amazing. Um, so I keep on saying all the time, it's people are going to remember how you make them feel, not what you say. So you might say something that might exclude someone, but the, the feeling is going to stay. And it's true in the sense that how we make each other feel can be a source of inclusion or exclusion. Um, so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be a coach for this amazing team and I wish them all the best and I do feel uh, we have hope the future is bright if the future is in the hands of these amazing people. So thank you for the opportunity and uh, really great work here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have fun. Incredible. Does anyone else have any other questions for this team? I have a comment. I have a question. Yeah, oh, go ahead, Romina. I remember we were in the same lab as this team. So we were kind of giving each other feedback and trying to brainstorm with them. And 
I remember you were dwelling, like trying to understand if diaries would be a good idea. And we were, I was kind of wondering how, where you get to at the end. And I'm very impressed with where, where it's come. And a question that I had at, um, that I was, I didn't really catch while you were saying was that you eliminated the likes that they could see of their own or other people. I didn't, I didn't really catch that. And what was the thought process behind it? Um, yeah, I can answer that question. So what we decided to do was that every person that has an account can see the number of likes and reactions that they got to their own drawings, but they cannot see the likes and reactions that people have given to them. So that I can still like, for example, if you have a drawing and I have a drawing, I can like heart emoji you, but I can't see that you have like 10 heart emojis. But if you react to my drawing, I can see how many reactions I personally have. So with that, we wanted to make sure that everyone felt really good about what drawings and art that they were producing without comparing themselves to people around them. I love that, especially since the day and age that we live in right now with all the social media, a lot of the people that do what they do is because of the likes and like they're trying to have this gratification of, from other people. So I, I appreciate that. I have a question around um, if you guys could just speak a little bit more about uh, sort of the pathway to adoption and implementation. What are the, the potential roadblocks that you see on that pathway for BJO and how could they mitigate those potential challenges? So unfortunately, uh, Jen and Maggie couldn't be here with us uh, to discuss this a little bit more thorough of an answer, but I'll, I'll give it my best shot uh, given what I know about the hospital ecosystem. So we have this idea that we're ready to pitch them as well as all the user research that we're ready to um, provide. But during the pandemic, um, a lot of the like not physically and medically necessary professionals are not able to actually be at the hospital right now. So that includes um, Maggie and Jen. So child life uh, professionals are not able to like be in the area and to be there to support like mental health and self-esteem problems that are uh, undoubtedly arising at the moment. So we're ready to pitch this to them and uh, hopefully by the time the pandemic is over, we'll have the web app ready uh, to go and we'll have tested it hopefully with a couple more people. And then uh, we'll probably have to talk to their, um, to the professionals there who are interested primarily in security, I suspect about how we can get this integrated uh, in their networks and how we can make sure that it's safe um, for the patients to use without um, their personal information being like leaked. And also having, uh, so one of the big concerns that we had was making sure that even when patients were discharged, they could still keep up with this community and how we can still integrate that um, even as patients go home. I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or comments that they'd like to share? I just have a quick, I think, um, re this over the quarantine times, one of the activities that some um, friends and I have been doing over Zoom is like online Pictionary and the like drawing representation of things. I don't know. I think oftentimes at first glance, things like that can almost feel kind of childish, but they're, it, it's really fun and I think um, even kind of older teenagers um, like I know I would get into it so <laughs> I think that's great and um, like just Paul said a really cool way to get around hip issues. Yeah th that was like one of the like one of the toughest challenges we had was this transition to pandemic but like we had had an ongoing challenge this entire semester which is understandably the kids who are in the hospital at this time have to focus on their health and we can't get into their headspace. We can't interview them necessarily. So this whole unfortunate situation really put us in the headspace of someone who like does not have control over their surroundings, is stuck in a place where like they might not be able to go, is distance from their friends. So it gave us like a very, very small idea of like what our population might be like. And I think that helped us. Um, we might not have thought um, people would enjoy like Pictionary as much until we were in the situation where like that's how I might communicate with my friends. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. 
I'm curious, um, also from your team, because you guys have the experience of, uh, of sharing a lab with the ADAPT team, like Romina mentioned, um, as you reflect on that experience, if you could share any feedback on sort of how it helped your team in terms of pushing you guys along or, or testing your thought process, et cetera. Yeah, I think it was really nice to bounce ideas off each other. And sometimes when we're like in the same group and we're talking between ideas, it's um, really nice. But if we have like another set of new eyes to um, give us feedback, it's, it was really nice to have them in the lab with us. Um, and I think we just, it was a nice atmosphere in there um, with everybody. And it was also nice to see them because this year it was, we didn't get to see all the Fung fellows as often. So at least to me, I just like really love to even just like see them in the room. It was really nice. Did you want to add anything, Jess? Or are you good? <laughs> Oh yeah, no, I just, I remember early on, like when we were talking to the ADAPT team, they really helped us out a lot with um, trying to find unique people to talk to and get around. Like we can't necessarily talk to our user group and they gave us a lot of really great ways to like, let's reach out to, you know, like experts on Twitter. Let's find like different ways that we can try to get information of our user group. And that was fantastic. And it's of course awesome to see how amazing your pivot has been in your team as well. So just one quick question. I know your team has gone on quite a journey and come with a lot of different prototypes over this time. And I wanted to hear if you were able to give your team advice at the beginning, being where you are now, what would that be? That's a great question. I think we hit a lot of hurdles. As our mentor Hassan kind of mentioned, we hit so many like walls in this journey of like finding what we can to do to help. Um, but we kind of, we kind of figured it out as we went along the journey. And I think we wouldn't have learned all the lessons if we hadn't gone through those and bumped into those roadblocks. Um, but I, I would just, yeah, I would just advise myself to just like keep persisting, even if, you know, this is like your third idea with your group or fourth idea or fifth idea. And it, it's again, like, we have to scrap it again after like research and, you know, it, it can be frustrating, but I would just advise myself to like not get frustrated and just keep kind of keep persisting on. Yeah, I, I wish we had thrown more ideas at the wall early on, you know, like um, second semester, I think we really shifted away from like just focusing on research and making sure our idea was super, super perfect to the second semester, we were like, let's pick a couple of like prototypes and like try them out. And that like helped us move very, like a lot more rapidly. So I think maybe had we done that from the very beginning and like done, you know, like research in tandem with just trying something out, I think um, we could have like had a, maybe a different product or been at a different stage. I just wanted to add on, uh, in addition to Miko's note about persistence, uh, we, like, as it was alluded to, we went through a bunch of different ideas and prototypes. And I think one really thing, like important thing to keep in mind would be to like, not get too attached to things or concepts or ideas, because really there's so much, like there are so many gears turning at the same time that if you get fixated on one, like Jess said, it's, it's not going to be a very, very good solution. Um, and so keeping in mind that we have to be fluid with our approach uh, was definitely th something I wish I'd, I had, I'd been more ready to be more fluid with my approach, I think, um, would have been nice. Awesome. That is such a good question, Adrian. I'm wondering if um, anyone from the other teams also want to share any reflections they have on lessons learned looking back on the process and advice that they would give to incoming honors fun fellows. I think um, I really just echo what was said about 
trying more sooner. Um, I think it was maybe January or February when um, one of y'all on the teaching staff, maybe many of y'all on the teaching staff, I should probably correct myself, um, I said, you can test your assumptions with prototypes. Um, and it was like, oh, which it seems wild to say, but it was also something that we hadn't like thought to do. We were like, no, we have to have everything all, all of our ducks in a row before we can start testing, like before we show this to people. And I think, yeah, that's definitely the biggest lesson learned as far as I'm concerned. It's like, no, like go, go forward, go fast, like, um, and, and keep, like, just keep iterating because iteration is how we, like, improve. Um, and that's how we find, like, really powerful, like, how we innovate to, like, really powerful impact. Awesome. Yeah, I think I'd also Thank add you. just, go ahead. Sorry. That was great, Rosie, and everyone else who shared. Um, just trust yourself too. Like if you were to ask the teaching staff that was on our like practice call this morning, like they saw a different presentation <laughs> than what we just gave. And like, sometimes it really comes together at the end. And um, when it feels weird, J just Paul um, told us in a video call a couple weeks ago, he's like, I've had this experience before when something doesn't feel right. And that's, um, or not right, something doesn't feel sure and that's entrepreneurship. And like, I think there were many times where our project didn't feel, we weren't sure about it. And I think we had a lot of trust, um, both within ourselves, but also the teaching staff trusting us and saying it's gonna be a right that um, pushes through. And so just, you know, having a mantra of like, I believe in myself, I believe in this team is helpful. Fantastic. All right, well, Caroline, our, um, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, should I start screen sharing? Yeah, that would be great. Um, I'll open it up to Bitmark, our last team and our Bitmark project partner just joined. Welcome, Michael. We're so happy that you can be here with us. Hi, right, thanks. I think Sean will join us uh, in a bit too. All right, I'll go ahead and get started. So thanks everyone for joining today. We're excited to share our work um, with Bitmark. And so yeah, we'll start with a little story. So as a toddler, I didn't really care when my dad came home from work. Um, I cared when he turned on his computer. I got so excited by that soothing sound that came on when his chunky Windows laptop turned on. My Dad says it was the beginning of my interest in music, but I argue that it was the first of many times that I was actually fascinated with tech. Today's college students are the world's first digital natives. We're among the first people on this earth to have grown up using technology, and we produce more data than any generation that preceded us. But we've also been normalized to not care where it goes or what's done with it. I mean, I've been clicking through terms of service since I got a Neopets account when I was eight. And as much as I loved receiving Pop Tropica ads in return, I can't help but wonder, what if my data could be used to benefit more than just myself? And what if information like my embarrassing COVID step counts could be used for health research? So over the past year, my team and I addressed that very question. Extending upon Bitmark's existing data trust, which allows people to both securely share their data and claim ownership of it, we asked, how might we empower college students to understand their digital footprint, take ownership of personal data, and help di diversify health research using Bitmark's data trust? We worked with our advisory board of peers to co-create our solution around Bitmark's platform with a three-pronged approach, um, education, consent, and research. So the first part of our solution is education. As Lauren addressed, students currently aren't concerned about concerned enough about their data privacy to change the way they actually interact with the internet. We aim to tackle this by educating our user on their digital footprint and give, give them steps that they can take to secure their digital identity. We built out a website, we called it Digital Footprint Kit, 
where we judge various apps on their creepiness based on their privacy concerns and give clear recommendations on how to engage more safely on these apps. We hope that by giving the user the ability to see the creepiness of the apps they use in a transparent manner, they will be empowered to change their digital habits and behaviors. And this can hopefully be a big motivator for com big companies to change their behaviors as well. Next, uh, we address the issue of the consent process. The current terms and service and consent process is a huge barrier to meaningful understanding. We were lucky to co-create with our advisory board and test a consent process that's easy to understand and incentivize users to grasp what they're agreeing to. Users are able to see a thorough terms of service and then are able to click on and step through a simpler explanation of each part. Entertaining and inter interactive visuals will engage them to make these seemingly tricky concepts very simple. At the end of each section, they respond to a concept check that ensures that they know what they're getting into. And these explanations make it clear that they have full control over what their data is used for and outline how they can remove it in the trust at any time. Lastly, we addressed research applications. Current health pra research practices rely on recruitment methods that leave low-income minority communities grossly underrepresented. We believe that health researchers can diversify this, their studies through the integration of digital data sets. We assess three different data sources on their applicability to, these, to health research, um, mainly uh, Facebook data, Google Maps data, and screen time data. Based on our analysis, we found that all of these data sets contain both user inputted information, such as age and gender, as well as inferred data like political affiliation and travel history. We also found that users are reluctant to share sensitive information like location data, but this is typically the information that's most useful for research studies. And lastly, we found that while sampling from these diverse data sets can increase representation in health research, it still leaves behind individuals that don't have access to mobile devices, which can potentially lead to bias resulting in, um, relating to um, socioeconomic status. Um, and here um, we have depicted a, um, how we envision our model working all together. The main source of revenue would be coming from uh, subscription fees paid by research institutions. And um, after exploring um, various incentives options to compensate users for their data, we found that personalized reports, education, as well as revenue would be an effective um, compensation method. We hope that with our solution, we're able to get to closer to a world where individuals are the owners of their own data and are empowered to have healthy digital habits. And we wanted to give a shout out to Bitmark, uh, the Fund Fellowship staff, our advisory board, and um, our other fellow fellows and our mentor, Maya Sari. Um, oh, we can open up to questions now. Thanks. Megan, you're muted. Oh, I just open up to questions. Yeah, really great job team. So any questions from the audience? Hello. Alex. Um, thank you. Um, it, it's really great to um, hear about a solution to um, the terms, the unending uh, scrolling. Um, which um, I also um, ignore. Um, your solution, is, what you're describing is definitely so much cooler than reading the terms. However, it also assumes your audience's willingness to be taught. And I'm just thinking about, for instance, you know, I, I get an app. Um, the other day I got an app um, to look at the sky, at the nighttime sky. And it wants to give me a lot of tutorials. And I don't have patience for tutorials. I just want to kind of get into it and, and, and start playing around. So I'm just wondering, based on your preliminary work, uh, how convinced are you that um, your users will have patience to go through what genuinely seems like a really cool interface, um, but still has this learning um, aspect to it, which, you know, could be tough. Yeah, I can um, start to address that with a couple points. So um, the first one being is that I think we had a lot of the same questions that uh, you just brought up in the first semester and we're kind of like, how do we get people to care about something they don't care about without, you know, the classic thing that would be like a dramatic negative event, right? Um, and that was something we struggled with a long time. And then we had a great conversation with our partner, Michael, who's on, who essentially said, you know, even if 3% of people care about this, start there 
help those people who care about it get ownership over their data and then we can step by step get closer to a place where more people care and more people are taking that ownership so the first part of the answer is um at this point we're probably only going to get people who care to begin with and who have some sort of interest downloading the app in the first place right um and the second is uh we did think about and uh build in some kind of forced learning right so that's the big idea behind the concept check which uh we spoke a lot about and kind of trialed out um and decided that the best way to kind of get people to think about what they were reading or visualizing or whatever it might be um, was to get them to reflect on that and choose an answer but not be so kind of dictatorial that if they didn't get it right they had to you know go back and try again and instead um, that they're provided with the correct answer um, once they once they try it out yeah hopefully that answers that question could you guys share a little bit more with the audience about some of the broader lessons learned that you've had about your experience with the advisory board Certainly. Um, so we didn't talk too much about it in the presentation, but uh, yeah, so we worked with an advisory board throughout the design process. Um, and this was a group of college students that we recruited with interests in, um, in data privacy. And we also wanted to recruit from um, diverse backgrounds and um, diverse ways of thinking and disciplines. So we set out to do that and we met um, for five weeks uh, on a weekly basis and became pretty close friends with them. Um, one of the biggest advantages of working with um, other college students is that because we're college students, we can build that rapport pretty easily. Um, and we were able to build trust on, at a pretty like quick pace. So our conversations um, were pretty open and honest when it came to them providing feedback um, on some of our prototypes or otherwise um, really co-creating or co-ideating with us on some of the ideas that we presented today. Um, I think in terms of lessons learned, um, we, we actually are working with our advise, two of our advisory board members to get more feedback on um, their experience. Um, working with us and some things that they've mentioned is they actually wanted to work um, even closer with Bitmark um, than they had. Um, we were kind of the most direct uh, points of contact for them throughout the whole process, but they were really engaged in the design process and wanted to learn so much more um, and work closer with our partner, which was really fascinating um, and like wonderful to learn. Um, and I think they also um, wanted us to give them more pushback, uh, which was a really interesting um, thing. We, we wanted to kind of center their narrative so much that we didn't really push back on their ideas, but they actually wanted us to challenge them a little bit to think and grow um, in the design process. So um, really fun working with them and would love to take more questions about that if anyone has any. And just, I just want to add to like echo what Lorraine just said, we provided pretty strong incentives for participation in the advisory board itself. But one of the kind of biggest measures that I have felt that has shown kind of how engaged they all were and how great it was is that two of them have just given up so many hours in these last couple of weeks to be really involved in our kind of um, process of working through and writing up a report about the advisory board you know and what went well and what went didn't go well so that seems to me like kind of a huge takeaway is that people care and want to be really involved awesome and adrian uh is having some audio quality issues i think but she posted a question in the chat saying how did you decide on the term creepiness what were other terms or strategies to make data ownership more friendly and less intimidating? Yeah, we actually spoke to our advisory board about this because we were talking about if we wanted to rate it on um, like stars for if you're more private or like we made them into little ghosts, like if we're creepy. And um, we kind of decided altogether like creepiness seemed better because it really shows like 
um i think it has a, it has like a you know it has a creepy feel to it it makes you like feel like oh whoa that that app has five creepy ghosts like i don't want to be on that that scares me um so i think it was like universally decided by the team that that effect that the word creepiness has like really um works on people um but we did think of like, oh, do we want to give like five stars, like super private experience um, and decided ultimately that um, creepiness had a larger effect on people. And also like if somebody also like if the company like that had the app with like more creepiness, we also came up with like a timeline. Um, I'm not sure if anyone saw, but like we decided we'd also have like a timeline of each app where it would show like how creepy it has been. And if there's like different time periods where there's breaches, then it would be like higher creepy value and like lower and show and it would show the user that um, so that people could see like um, if it got better or worse over time. Um, and yeah, we felt that this would have like the strongest effect on the user. Yeah. I'm jumping. Oh, sorry. Um, I was going to say early on in our design process, some of our team members actually went to a data privacy exhibit in San Francisco called the Classroom, and they had a big effect on the three of us who went just because they use more, I, I, I want to say like scare tactics in their exhibits, where a lot of the demonstrations they showed were like, Facebook has this much data on you. Um, Palantir has had all of these data privacy violations. And so that was very effective for us in making us care about our own privacy more. And we wanted to convey the same feelings in the product that we delivered. Yeah, and I'm um, following from what Megan said earlier. So when we, um, our team were actually brainstorming our like website, we came up with a few terms, and then I, I think me and Megan are like, "Haha, this is kind of funny, creepy." Um, we didn't think too much about it, but when we when we presented this during our advisory board meeting, they all seemed very um, like happy and excited about the idea. And they're like, "Oh yeah, that's the word. That's the right word." And we had visuals, and then they're like, "Yeah, we really vibe with that." So I guess it just speaks to the power of the advisory board and having um, users to test with, because I think um, you know our. Megan and I and other team, we didn't think too much about that work, but it became really powerful and became um, a moving part of our project. And also the whole like website itself got like restructured and like reformatted and like so much content was added, so much content was deleted based on our conversations we had two weeks ago. Awesome. I have a question for Michael uh, and the Bitmark team. I'm curious if you guys can just comment on um, kind of the journey of this project over the last year and how you see yourselves uh, using some of these insights and potentially scaling the solution that the team has created. Absolutely. Um, I was really impressed by the team's work over the past year. And so they've been able to keep me up to date and just be able to kind of follow along and um, see all these different angles that they took that we've never thought about. Um, it was really fantastic. And I'd be able to share that with the team. And so actually uh, we're working on a new health project now and I think um, our fellow teams knows about it. And so uh, we've been able to essentially incorporate a lot of these insights to make sure that we're covering those um, as we look to launch that in the next couple of weeks. Fantastic. Um, so I guess for, for the Bitmark team as well, since we asked this question to previous teams, what advice would you give to yourselves uh, if you could go back in time to the beginning of this project and or what advice would you give to incoming honors fellows next fall? Um, so to ourselves as in um, to Bitmar or to the fellows? Oh, that question is for the for the Bitmark team. But sorry, the Bitmark honors fellows oh, team. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Got it. I think on our part, we were very hesitant to try things in the beginning, especially when it came to, I guess, talking to our peers. We knew that data privacy was a very pressing, intimate issue, and we were afraid of doing things wrong. And so that held us back a lot for our first semester, just because we were so intimidated by the fact of approaching this from the wrong angle and potentially landing ourselves in a really bad solution. So I think if we could go back in time, we would have started the iteration process a little bit earlier, broken it down piece by piece and actually built it up, um, allow ourselves to fail and learn from those failures instead of trying to synthesize it all perfectly from the start. Fantastic. Any last uh, questions from the audience for this team? 
Yeah, I, I had a follow up. Did you um, test, test creepiness? Sorry, I got knocked off. So it's a follow up to a pre two questions ago. Um, did you market test creepiness like with your customers? Not yet. I, I'm seeing a no from uh, Lena and a yes from Jerome. Uh, well, I, I mean, market test, I think to me, insights outside the advisory board, but the advisory board is also our market. So yeah. yes and no. <laughs> okay, great. And then the, the other thing was, you know, this is a long way from, or maybe not, but you know, testing the, the burn book at the public interest tech summit, um, maybe a, I guess a little over a month now, kind of, um, why did you evolve or shift away from that or kind of what was the impetus for that? Yeah, so for those of you who aren't familiar, we were able to participate in the pit summit that Jennifer was hosting a couple of months ago, right before shelter in place happened. And we had the opportunity to speak with a lot of researchers and experts in the field of data privacy. And in that event, we had this idea of a burn book where we had our focus group write down things that they think they thought we were wrong about the current data practices and what they could improve on. So I don't think that was ever meant to be our official prototype rather than a way to get valuable information on the researcher side, figuring out what the pain points are in using data for research and shifting um, to new practices that are more ethical, more involved and easier to process for people who wanna work with these data sets. And for those of you who did not see it, it looked like a prototype. They had it like very sophisticatedly done it. So it's a, it was a great job and a great way to get um, do customer engagement on your on your final product. So good job, team. Yeah, I just want to applaud this team as well as all the other teams uh, for doing an excellent job of synthesizing a year's uh, a year's worth of work into. Um, into five minutes. And I think that this was just kind of the tip of the iceberg of each of your personal and team stories in terms of the journey that you guys had and, and what you learned. Um, but I'm just so impressed with uh, the final product and, and the way that you guys were resilient in your ability to uh, keep showing up and, and keep participating and even accelerating your participation and engagement during uh, shelter in place. So really applause and, and hats off to to all of you. I, th I think um, so we still have some time here. I, I want to give everyone back their, the rest of the evening, but I think um, it'd be nice to engage. So if there's other questions from the audience or anything else, um, Coleman or Frung Institute staff, if you have things you want to share. One question I'd, I'd love to hear from each of the teams is if um, what was most challenging of having to shift to this remote shelter in place related to your project? So we'll start with, I'll, I'll do it because we'll start with team draft. I, I'll be really honest. I think that the most um, difficult thing with the pandemic and the shelter in place um, is that it really um, it really affected our communication which is was our already kind of a weakness for us was was internal communication so um, I think for us and for our team and in our project I think that was kind of the biggest struggle was just that this really deepened kind of communication barriers that we could have maybe um, gotten through in person, um, but with this disconnected like isolation, I think it just got really exacerbated. Spreading smiles. I wanted to bounce off of what Rosie said. Because of the pandemic, like, everyone in the world suddenly got like a plate full of more stuff to deal with and it was a little bit overwhelming and it wasn't just our team it was also the staff of the hospital and so i mentioned before how um 
non-essential like aspects of the hospital were cut, including child life support. Um, so we weren't able to reach out to our um, customer group during the last few months because of our inability to access anyone in the hospital. Um, but also, I think the fact that like everyone on our team had so much going on at once, um, it did put a strain on communication, but it also, it was sort of a silver lining. Um, it showed me how valuable our team dynamic was because everyone was really, to, really ready to step up um, when other people were busy. And I think that was a pretty rad time. Nice. Bitmark team? I can share for our team. I think uh, one thing we really tried to do on our this team was that we really wanted to push the way we conducted research. I think we were all very like well accustomed with like, interviews, surveys, and we wanted to really use this time to like do um, try new methods out. So as you probably see, Jennifer, our burn book was a way to you know talk to researchers. But due to COVID, like we just could, um, I felt like a huge chunk of the way we interact with folks just like, was gone. We wanted to like do a lot of physical in-person things, and activity building, and we couldn't really do that no more. So we really um transition to like using social media more instead, but really miss the aspect of like seeing people and like I mean like to work with people and like try new ways to ask questions besides, you know, just interviewing. And then team adapt. I agree with Jerome. It's kinda of, it was kinda of hard for us to transition and to not not seeing anyone and not being able to go out and do like outreach, but um, we found alternatives and thanks to all of the people on, our t on, our, on my team, they were very good at reaching out to people, following up, you know, trying to make those connections, even though we were remote. So we really, like, I think did a good job, but it was hard to adjust in the beginning to like, oh, now what do we do now? How do we get these volunteers, you know? So, um, yeah, it, it was it was a little bit hard. And also one of our team members moved away and it was kind of like hard for her to adjust to her living situation. So um but she 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 did she made it in a way that we didn't even notice, you know, her performance was the same and, and we're really proud of her for that. So Yeah, and just to add on to that, I think one of the challenges that we also had as a team was how do we apply human-centered design to PPE in a COVID situation and like challenge the research that has been put into personal protective equipment for many, many years in the medical field. Um, and that was a huge question mark for us. And I think um, thinking about this whole situation with like the basics, like starting with the how might we and then like applying all those iterations of design on certain prototypes. Um, like slowly we were doing a lot of human-centered design before we even know it. And, and that was like a huge um, like blessing in disguise for us because it really challenged like how much do we know about the human-centered design and what is our instinct when we are posed with this sudden um, challenge. Um, and so, yeah, I think with the help of the staff, it really, and, and the question that they asked us and prompt us to shift our mindset in this way. So, yeah. Thank you. Well, um, really nice job. I think let's um, give a round of applause, virtual applause to all of our um, honors fellows. Really well done. Um, also, thank you again to our project partners. It really, um, you know, the fellowship experience is about working on real world projects and, and things that are impacting society and timely and, um, you know, current issues that that we're facing and um, you all provided those and then also adapted and provided support and understanding and um, really stepped up to support our students as they went to this remote um, shelter in place um, regarding the product projects. Um, also, thank you to our industry mentors, uh, Maya Lim, Amanda Brief, Hassan Rafiq, um, for really providing all of um, the guidance and support throughout this time and your professional expertise in this space. Um, thank you to Coleman Fung for joining us this evening. Um, also, all the alumni, 
um, and the Fung Institute staff, we really appreciate the support. Um, hope you enjoyed the presentations. We also have um, an event this Thursday, our year one students, May 7th, 2020. Um, I will link the Eventbrite. It's 5 to 7 p.m. Um, this Thursday. Um, so you're welcome to join us for that. Um, so any last comments or, or final remarks from anyone else? I do. So I, I wanted to ask you guys, both the honor fellows as well as the partners, one of the original concepts or objective was to provide you with a, an opportunity to develop deeper ties. And I know, you know, the pandemic is throwing a, a monkey wrench at the end, but do you feel your experience really afford you to really have that deeper tie amongst the team members, but also working with the partners? Um, I can jump in. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, pre Corona, um, the, the big event that really stands out in my mind, um, as kind of a pre and post, you know, as kind of a game changer for our cohort was definitely the retreat. Um, and I think after that, because it, it was a lot harder as an honors cohort, not seeing people outside of our teams as often to maintain those bonds and kind of continue those relationships. So I think after the retreat, I felt more comfortable kind of randomly reaching out to people um, just because we had developed a new level. And then I would say, I mean, I feel really lucky. I don't know, I can't speak for everyone, but um, our, the Bitmark team, I think we've come a huge way as uh, obviously as kind of coworkers and fellow fellows, but also just as um, close friends and, um, Zoom has forced us to, uh, or COVID has forced us to kind of become even more open and honest with each other about um, what's going on and stuff. So it impacted, I think, more so our ability to get to know and build deeper connections with people outside of our group. But definitely, I would say, if anything, brought us closer on our team. Other comment? Yeah, I'd say even just like as now routine has gone out the window, just like having um, the weekly team meetings was definitely like became much more of a highlight and I began to appreciate it a lot more than I ever had. Um, just because it was like pretty much the only thing in my life that I felt was constant was like, okay, on Thursday for two hours, I'm gonna see my team. And like that felt very special after. Well, great job, guys. Related to that, so not only did they adjust in all of this, um, adapt because shelter in place and COVID, work on these projects, but they were also mentoring our year one Fung Fellow teams uh, as part of the honors program and also um, leading some of the lab sections, even in remote learning. Um, so really great work to, um, to all of you, our inaugural fellows and helping us shape what this program is this year and for the future. So again, great job, everyone. Caroline, did you have anything um, to close out? No, I would just say uh, thank you all so much for joining and thank you especially to the Funk Fellows for all the hard work they have put in uh, over the course of this year and um, thank you, Coleman, and all the administrators uh, who make this uh, program a reality and, and possibility for these students. And um, yeah, just is so excited to see the turnout tonight. It's it's been really really awesome to see the support that you all are giving the students by by showing up and hearing about the incredible work that they've done. So with that, we'll hope to see you all on Thursday to hear the final presentations for our year one fellows and uh, hope that you all will also tune in next year for our final presentations, uh, including all the current honors fellows who will then be alumni next year. So.
Thank you all. Congratulations.